A client met his banker to discuss opening a restaurant in a busy airport. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of reaching for the sky. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. Hello again. Thanks for joining me. This is Astronomy Daily. I am your host, Andrew Dunkley. It's so good to have your company again. And joining me as always is our AI reporter, Hallie. Hi, Hallie. How are you? Hi, Andrew. Happy Space Week. Yes, of course. It is Space Week. It starts today. And happy Space Week to you, Hallie. I think you've got a story about that, so you might as well kick off the news with it. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Humanity's role in space exploration is once again being celebrated. The 2022 edition of World Space Week starts today, October 4th, with events highlighting the theme, Space and Sustainability. The week is time to coincide with the 65th anniversary of the Sputnik launch from the Soviet Union, which became the first human-made object in orbit on October 4, 1957. Since then, thousands of satellites and a lot of space debris have prompted discussions about the effects on astronomy and other space activities. According to organizers, World Space Week will celebrate two branches of the topic, achieving sustainability in space further saying their focus is on the orbital area surrounding Earth itself, being a finite resource. Emergency responders dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Ian in Florida seem to have suffered extra setbacks, as a major solar flare disrupted radio communications on Sunday. The solar flare, a powerful X-1 erupted from the sun and peaked about 30 minutes later. Since solar flares travel at the speed of light, The burst of electromagnetic radiation caused an immediate radio blackout up to an hour long on the sun-facing side of the planet. The affected region included the whole of the U.S., according to the Space Weather Watch. The radio blackout, classed by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration as a strong R3 category, most likely affected rescue workers using 25 MHz radios to communicate in areas where Hurricane Ian had already knocked out cell phone networks. Images from the Ingenuity helicopter show it had a piece of debris fluttering from its leg during its most recent flight. A blog post from NASA said a small piece of foreign object debris was seen in footage from the Mars helicopter's navigation camera for a portion of its 33rd flight on September 24. This piece of debris was not visible in navcam footage from the previous flight. The debris can be seen during the earliest frames to approximately halfway through the video, when it fell from the leg and drifted back to the Mars surface. The Ingenuity team reported, all telemetry from the flight and a post-flight search and transfer are nominal and show no indication of vehicle damage. The most likely explanation is that the piece of fabric is something left over from Perseverance's parachute, or descent stage or even the back shell which all worked in tandem to bring the rover and helicopter safely to the surface of Mars back in February of 2021. India's Mars Orbiter Mission, or MOM, may have finally reached the end of its operations after eight years spent orbiting the Red Planet. Ground stations operated by the Indian Space Research Organization have lost communication with the spacecraft. The precise cause isn't yet clear, the orbiter may have run out of propellant, MOM's battery may drain beyond the safe operating limit or an automated maneuver may have cut communications, according to media reports. Having operated at Mars for eight years, MOM, also called Mangalayan, has far exceeded its expected mission life of just six to ten months. The craft was launched in November 2013 and entered orbit around Mars in September 2014. And that's the news, Andrew. Thank you, Hallie. We'll catch up with you again at the end of today's show. Now to other events in astronomy and space science on this, the 4th of October. Uranus is a strange little planet with its clockwise rotation and the fact that it spins on its back. Uh, Well, virtually anyway, pretty close. Well, a new study may have found a plausible explanation for this strange behaviour. It could have been caused by a moon migrating away from the planet, resulting in Uranus being pulled over on its side. And it uh, wouldn't even need to be a very big moon, as it turns out. Something half the mass of our own moon could have done it, although a, a larger moon would be a more likely contender. Now, the reasoning has been detailed in a paper led by astronomer Melanie Salenfest of the National Centre for Scientific Research in France. 
this paper has been accepted in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, although it hasn't been peer-reviewed yet. Some scientists have come up with models to explain the planet's behaviour in the past, including the possibility that a massive object collided with Uranus, and that was pretty well the most popular theory. And uh, other theories include uh, the fact that it was um, hit by a bunch of smaller objects creating the same effect, and it happened over a period of time. Both are plausible theories. But uh, the team that did uh, this latest uh, study performed simulations with a range of parameters, including the mass of a hypothetical moon, and they found that a moon with a minimum mass of around half that of our moon, Earth's moon, could tilt Uranus towards 90 degrees if it migrated more than 10 times the radius of Uranus at a rate higher than 6 centimetres per year, which is pretty fast, but still not beyond the possibility. However, a larger moon with the size, um, however, a larger moon with a size comparable to Ganymede was more likely to have been the culprit if this, in fact, is the way Uranus ended up lying on its back. The researchers said that this new picture of the tilting Uranus appears quite promising to them, although it's not clear whether Uranus could have hosted a moon large enough and at a high enough uh, migration rate to produce this scenario. And it will, the researchers say, be challenging to prove. But, you know, theory is good, because then you can test it, and maybe they'll come up with an answer. As we mentioned last week, the Juno space probe was due to do a flyby of Jupiter's moon Europa. It was a one-off opportunity to get close to the ice moon before Juno's orbit deteriorates too much. Well, it looks like the manoeuvre was a success with Juno capturing detailed images of the moon. The probe came within 220 miles of Europa's surface and the first picture of Europa's equatorial region shows the surface as icy and rather rugged, which is not surprising. Scott Bolton is the principal investigator on the Juno mission and he described the picture as remarkable science given that the probe had to adjust its trajectory to get close enough to Europa and reduce its orbital time of Jupiter from 43 to 38 days in the process. Uh, It looks like the risk was worth it. Juno was able to collect data for two hours while skimming over the Moon's surface at 14 miles per second. Uh, The interest in Europa is purely based on its potential to contain liquid oceans, which raises a very significant question about whether or not it could host some kind of life. The team behind Juno also noticed that Europa's surface hasn't changed much since the last set of pictures were taken over 20 years ago. NASA will be returning to Europa in 2030 with the Europa Clipper mission, designed to study the atmosphere, and like Saturn's moon Enceladus, They're hoping to find the markers for the creation of life in some of Europa's geysers, if they indeed exist. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. And for the first time, researchers have captured millimetre wavelength light from an intense explosion brought on by the merger of a neutron star and another star. By using the Atacama Large Millimetre Array, Scientists say that this burst of light was one of the most powerful short-duration gamma-ray bursts ever seen and produced one of the most luminous afterglows ever recorded. The brightest and most energetic explosions in the universe, gamma-ray bursts, may produce more energy in a few seconds than our sun will produce in its entire lifetime. Can you imagine? GRB 211106A belongs to the um, GRB subclass called short-duration gamma-ray bursts. The catastrophic merging of binary star systems containing neutron stars leads to these explosions, which are thought to be the source of the heaviest metals in the universe, such as platinum and gold. Now, a short-duration gamma-ray burst usually lasts only a few tenths of a second, Scientists then look for the afterglow, an emission of light caused by the interaction of the jets created with the surrounding gas. Even still, they're difficult to detect. Only half a dozen short-duration GRBs have been detected at radio uh, wavelengths, 
and until now, none have been detected in the millimetre wavelength. So this is rather exciting. Joe Pesci, the National Science Foundation Program Officer for the NRAO and ALMA, said, These observations are fantastic on many levels. They provide more information to help us understand the enigmatic gamma ray bursts and neutron star astrophysics in general. And they demonstrate how important and complementary multi-wavelength observations with space and ground-based telescopes are in understanding astrophysical phenomena. The findings, if you want to chase them up, were recently published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. We're almost done for another day. Hallie, anything before we go? Yes, it's not only the start of Space Week, Andrew. It's National Golf Lovers Day in America, and I know you love your golf. So happy Golf Lovers Day. Thank you, Hallie. We'll have to play around one day. That didn't come out right. See you, Hallie. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Thanks again for joining us on Astronomy Daily. Don't forget to visit our website, spacenuts.io, and you can click on the Astronomy Daily tab and check out all these stories and more and subscribe to the newsletter. It's totally and absolutely free. And we'll be back again with another edition of Astronomy Daily tomorrow from me, Andrew Dunkley. Thanks for listening. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley.